Hello, and welcome to this CNCF webinar. Today, we will be talking about how eBPF can be leveraged to improve the efficiency of Kubernetes security use cases. My name is Oshrat Nir, and I am the developer advocate for Cubescape and Arma. With me today is Chris Kuhl, Principal Technical Product Manager at Microsoft and an Inspector Gadget Maintainer. Take it away, Chris. OK, thanks. Um, so my name is Chris Kuhl. I am here to present Inspector Gadget and give you an introduction to eBPF. Um, so let's get started with the eBPF part. Um, eBPF is basically small programs uh, that you can load into the kernel as bytecode, um, and they run inside of a, a virtual machine or you know a sandbox. And so this allows for one to easily make modifications uh, to the behavior of the kernel um, without having to recompile it. Um, so previously to do something like this, you would have to uh, build a kernel module. That kernel module would then be you know, loaded into the kernel and the kernel module would have full access to the kernel. Uh, this means that it could, you know, if it were not programmed correctly or, you know, maliciously, uh, it could, you know, crash your kernel um, in, in the, or do other things. Um, you know, eBPF uh, runs in, in the sandbox, um, so it's, um, you know, isolated from those kind of issues and we'll talk, we'll look at that in just a second. Um, main use cases for this are tracing and observability, um, security, um, networking, and we're going to look at some examples of these in just a little bit. So EPF really brings a lot of flexibility to the kernel. There's really no need to wait for certain kernels when you want to make certain changes. Um, and you can just create a BPF program, load it in, and as long as that kernel supports the functionality that you're using with that BPF program, which um, nowadays there's very good support for eBPF. We don't really need to um, worry so much as we did you know, a few years ago. Um, so as long as there's support for that, um, then that program can, can run in, in pretty much any kernel if you have the right permissions. So it's really efficient. Um, it, it's run as a just-in-time just compiler. You know, it makes performance overhead very low. But another aspect of, of the performance is that often to do things uh, previously that you can now do with eBPF, you would have to have like a back and forth between the kernel space and the user space. And what that calls is a, is a context switch, because every time you pass data or pass operation between kernel space and, and, um, and user space, you get a context switch. And that's very costly. And so with eBPF, uh, we can often do those kind of things fully in kernel, uh, so you get really maximal performance and just basically pass up the results or the information you're looking for. Um, it's also safe. And so when we say safe, uh, what this means is, you know, how, as we hinted before, um, you know, you cannot corrupt in um, memory uh, with a BPF program. It's actually um, proven safe. Again, the same sense of math, the mathematics can be proven um, by folks who do that. Uh, I'm not one of them. Um, but basically, it's safe in the, in the sense that the kernel is safe. Uh, this doesn't mean that you still can't and you still should not be um, wary of, of, you know, uh, which eBPF programs you're loading, uh, because you know those can change the behavior of the system. For example, if you uh, attach to a network um, socket, uh, it could you know um, you know block all the network um, activity um, there. So yeah, you, you know it's safe in that it's not going to crash your kernel. So um, and finally, um, covering some of the use cases more in depth. Uh, tracing and observability, it just really fits uh, what the functionality that eBPF provides because often you want to be able to dynamically um, look into something, uh, extract the information you want, um, and to do that in a, obviously a performant way that doesn't really affect um, you know, the overall system performance. Um, and you, know, you want to be able to, to get information you know, at different levels of the system. And eBPF allows you to get that at a very low level. Um, and so it's super performant uh, and it allows you to attach to different things. Uh, here, you know, we list some K probes, trace points, and U probes. These are things that, um, you know, points where you can attach uh, and are designed to be attached um, inside of 
um, the kernel, well, in the case of uprobes, it's actually in user space. Um, and, you know, you can attach to sockets, um, syscalls, um, etc. And so on the security basis, you know, when we mentioned the things you can attach to, um, these things are being expanded uh, quite often. Um, you have in kernel 5.7, uh, we had the new possibility of attaching to Linux security modules. This allows eBPF programs to basically make decisions about whether an operation should be allowed or denied. Uh, and so, as I mentioned before, now this policy can be loaded directly into the kernel. And so, uh, the final one we want to cover here is networking. Uh, networking, um, you know, BPF programs um, can attach to different places in the network subsystem, uh, including all the way into the, the hardware. Um, XDP uh, is, a, is a, func a functionality that allows you to basically do hardware routing using EBPF programs, which is very powerful and very performant. You know, you have uh, companies like Facebook who use um, EBPF uh, for their load balancing, uh, and they have, you know, if you look, uh, there are they have really great results in using this. Um, you know, it basically allows you to drop, modify, and forward network packets. In the Kubernetes space, I think the most popular thing is uh, you'll find is Cilium, uh, which uses eBPF extensively for its uh, network functionality, which is basically what it does. Okay, now we're going to look at Inspector Gadget. Inspector Gadget is a tool uh, that we have built um, basically to collect data from the system and make it very easy and make it um, a kind of a common platform uh, that anybody can use um, and also share individual um, BPF programs, what we packaged what called gadgets. Um, and so let's take a look at it. So yeah, it's a framework. Uh, it's basically designed for building, uh, packaging, deploying, and, and running uh, eBPF programs. And we package these into what we call gadgets, which we'll look at in just a second. Um, and it's primarily for debugging and inspecting Linux systems. So this is, you know, doing that means you're collecting data. And so you can think of it as a data collection a tool for eBPF. It's a kind of a container-like runtime. Um, and we say a container-like uh, because it supports a lot of the, you know, verbs you would know from a container system. Uh, build, push, pull, and run. And these are um, what we call image-based gadgets because they are packaged within um, OCI images. So it supports um, and understands Kubernetes. Uh, what this means is that when you take the data from the eBPF program, it comes from the kernel. It doesn't know anything about Kubernetes. And so we enrich that data with high level information about Kubernetes, uh, the container runtime, etc. And you can also filter um, the data that you get um, using these higher level um, primitives. Um, for example, if you say, just show me things from this single pod, you know, you can do that with Inspector Gadget. And the way that actually works is that you, we, Inspector Gadget takes that information, it translates it into what the kernel understands. For example, if you say, only show um, the information from this container, uh, it needs to translate that to a mount namespace, um, a, um, a C group, uh, various things. Um, and so Inspector Gadget takes care of that. You don't have to do that yourself. Um, it's very easily deployed inside of um, Kubernetes. You just basically do kubectl gadget deploy. And here you have basically uh, gadget as the subcommand for kubectl. This is actually a plugin, uh, which you can install with crew. And you just run deploy, and it'll put it in your cluster. Uh, it also supports running directly on a Linux host. So you don't have to have Kubernetes with this. And this is uh, actually a very powerful feature because sometimes you might be running Kubernetes, uh, but you want to debug Kubernetes. And if you're running uh, with um, you know, full Kubernetes support, that means it's relying on some of the things like the API server. And sometimes you want to get underneath that. And this direct Linux support uh, allows you to do that. It also supports many different export targets, uh, CLI, of course, um, for interactive sessions, a gRPC when you're dealing with the data programmatically. Uh, Prometheus, um, or you know, just the logs, etc. Uh, we also have a mechanism to do some user space um, processing and, and package that inside of a gadget, uh, so that you can deliver it along with the um, you know, the gadget itself and along with the BPF program. And this is done in WebAssembly modules, and you can do this then uh, in any language that WebAssembly supports. You know, Go, Rust, uh, JavaScript, uh, etc. 
So for deploying the sign side of Kubernetes, uh, it looks something like this. You have a kubectl gadget or whatever third-party tool you create uh, to interact with this. Uh, the API calls uh, for kubectl go through the API server, uh, and they um, interact with the inspector gadget pod. This inspector gadget pod is actually deployed with the uh, command that I showed you earlier, the kubectl gadget deploy, and this will go happen on all the nodes. And then when you once you deploy that, you can do you know run a particular gadget, and this pod will take care of pulling that down, loading it, etc. So now we support a lot of different uh, types of gadgets, and if you look at this diagram, you'll see, uh, for example, that there are gadgets that um, attach to uh, sockets, um, gadgets that attach to syscalls, um, gadgets that attach to certain block devices. And so the way BPF works is it attaches these things, and when an event happens, for example, with sockets, um, when a packet comes in, uh, it'll, it'll run, right? And if it determines uh, that that's something of interest, it'll put it into the eBPF map, which is then consumed by the user space. But we'll take a look at that in just a second. In fact, let's do that right now. And so I'm gonna, here's a, a diagram of basically how Inspector Gadget works. So at the top left, you'll see the OCI registry. Now that's the part that generally does not, um, is not on the local machine or not on um, in your local infrastructure. That might be something like uh, GitHub packages, et cetera. And then uh, you have uh, the local gadget store. This is where gadgets are stored when they're um, pulled down. Um, and then you have here the ICE um, IG process. Uh, this is the inspector gadget process. Um, this can be you know, in Kubernetes or it can be on a local host. Um, and then uh, you see this yellow line that delineates the user space on top and the kernel space underneath. Because what we'll do in the end, we'll load those BPF programs into kernel space and we'll pull out the data on the other side using Inspector Gadget. So let's take a look at this. So the first thing that happens is when you run, do an um, IG uh, run a gadget um, or a kubectl gadget run uh, a particular gadget, uh, then what it'll do, it'll first check in the local gadget store. If it's not there, it'll go to the OCI registry. Uh, it'll fetch that and put it down into uh, the local uh, store. Once it's in the local store, uh, the gadget manager can then load this into the kernel. And in this case, we are attaching to a socket. Um, and so when it loads this BPF program, it also creates a BPF, um, a BPF map, and this is represented by this yellow circle in this diagram. And so, once that's loaded, it's waiting for an event. When an event does happen, it then loads that into the um, map, and Inspector Gadget is ready to do its job on the user space side. So it pulls out that information, uh, it sends it to the enrichment um, uh, processes, and you know this will enrichment enrich it with information about the Kubernetes. Uh, it'll enrich it, about, enrich it with the container runtime information, and this supports a Docker container D, etc. Uh, and we're also working on System D uh, support. So even when you're not running inside of a you know container infrastructure, um, you can still you know see what service it's uh, associated with. So the next step is an optional step, and this is the post processing step. Um, now, there are times, for example, we have a very simple example for this, and that's our DNS gadget. The DNS gadget, um, the DNS uh, actual information is formatted in a way that is not so easy for uh, BPF to process uh, because it needs some loops and things like that, which are, you know, kind of, BPF is a little bit restrictive with what it does inside the kernel. And so we actually have a um, WASM module that simply formats the string the way we want it. Um, and so that's a very simple example, but you can do a lot more with that. And then the next step is we pass that on to the data output element. And this can be, if you're on, running on the CLI in an interactive process, it might just be a tabular information, or it could be in JSON uh, format. Uh, if you're, you know, if you want to send this to, um, you know, an API, uh, you can use gRPC, uh, but you can also send this to uh, Prometheus or even logs. So. So I hope that gives you kind of a, a good overview of, of how this works. Uh, one thing to note here is that a lot of what I'm talking about today is currently behind an experimental flag. Um, 
that experimental flag should be removed in the next couple of releases. Um, and we're kind of excited about getting it out there in its full form because we believe um, that this is a extremely uh, powerful system that takes a lot of the boilerplate out, but not only a lot of the boilerplate out of people who are developing things such as the CubeScape folks, um, but also it allows uh, will, will allow us to share uh, eBPF programs uh, more easily and for people to package them and just to have this off the shelf experience that we understand from uh, containers. And so it's really about not only about making this easier, but also creating a community around this um, and enabling you know, people to really uh, you know, share what they create. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. In this part of the webinar, we will be examining a security use case that uses eBPF by way of a gadget from Inspector Gadget. In a talk in KubeCon North America in 2020, Shane Lawrence of Shopify said, no matter how good a job we do on the left, there is always going to be an issue that prevention didn't catch. When protecting critical services, we need effective monitoring. This seems like it adds toil to already overwhelmed cloud security and DevOps practitioners. In the next few slides, I will be talking about the source of overwhelm and how using eBPF and applying additional logic can actually reduce that load a bit. This image depicts what I have started calling naive scanning. It shows the basic method of most every vulnerability scanner you have probably worked with to date. Essentially, what we can see here is a scanner testing the packages in an image and overlaying information from one or more CVE databases, like NVD, for instance. The result is typically a long list of vulnerabilities with their CVSS score. That is a source of the overwhelm I mentioned earlier. Cubescape took vulnerability scanning to the next level by enriching the original scan with runtime data. The way Cubescape works is by installing a node agent. This node agent uses Inspector Gadget to hook into different eBPF events. It uses file activity information to understand which files are opened in each of the workloads that are running in our Kubernetes cluster. This information enables it to cross-reference the SBOM together with this information and find which software packages were touched during runtime and if they are loaded into memory or not. So, if a Python package was opened, Cubescape knows from eBPF that it was opened and it'll take the Python file to see if it's listed in the SBOM and belongs to one of the packages. If it belongs to one of the packages, then it will be marked as in use and reachable. Cubescape then feeds the vulnerability scanner with the original SBOM that naive scanners use and with a filtered SBOM it created. The filtered SBOM only lists the packages that were touched during runtime, giving the scanner that precious runtime information mentioned earlier. In the proof of concept for reachability, Armo researchers ran a scan with and without reachability on a Redis image. We can see that running a vulnerability scan on the Redis image tested identified 166 vulnerabilities. But when looking through the lens of reachability, things aren't that bleak. The number shrinks to 36, which represents a 78% reduction. A more current example shows that scanning Redis naively, that is with a static scanner, we get one critical vulnerability and 11 high. The common practice is that these are those that you need to fix as soon as possible. Using the trace open gadget from Inspector Gadget, Cubescape was able to identify which files are touched by the container during runtime. This scan gave us zero criticals and one high. This exercise was able to highlight that less packages are actually used in runtime. It created a modified SBOM without the files that are not accessed. The result being a list of the vulnerabilities that can hurt us today. In this example, it's just one, thus guiding us to a prioritized list of vulnerabilities. Now, let's take a more detailed look at how Cubescape utilizes Inspector Gadget for this. Cubescape uses the trace open gadget, which gives it information about the file opened by the system. That includes file name, file path, user ID, and group ID. On the right, 
you can see a merged PR from Ben Hirschberg, lead Cubescape maintainer, co-founder, and CTO of Armor. This highlights the beauty of using open source projects. If something is not giving you everything you need, you can change it upstream to benefit everyone. This is what the implementation looks like on Armor platform, which is powered by Cubescape. Users get the results of the static scan. However, they can then filter for reachability and for every vulnerability found, users can see if it is reachable or not. CVE reachability was the first Cubescape implementation of eBPF, which enriches runtime information for the purposes of securing Kubernetes clusters. But it is definitely not the last. Armo is now working on adding the following features to Armo platform. SecComp profile, in order to automate the creation and management of SecComp profiles, providing fine-grained control over system calls that containers can make. Network policy generates network policies based on in-cluster data. Network policy in order to generate network policies based on in-cluster data. And runtime anomaly detection, which is pretty self-explanatory. In conclusion, eBPF is a useful tool in the cloud-native world as it enables visibility into runtime with a relatively low cost in comparison to running scripts of traces and probes on the Linux kernel. There are many areas in which eBPF can help gain important insights. One of them is security. Using eBPF, security use cases can be enriched with runtime data, which ultimately saves practitioners a lot of toil and helps them focus on what actually matters. I'd like to thank Chris from Inspector Gadget for joining me today, and thank you for watching. If you'd like to keep in touch with Armo, you can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. If you would like to follow or join the Cubescape community, you can check it out on Twitter or GitHub. There are also Cubescape channels on the CNCF Slack. Stop by there and have a chat with me. See you next time.